wonderful considerations in front of us this morning and your minds are going to be challenged as we proceed uh, because when we get to Gideon in our third session this morning you're going to see just how wonderful, how lofty the type of our Lord Jesus Christ is in connection with the confirmation of the Abrahamic covenant. But where would you start having given a vision up front of Christ taking a bride, capturing the city of the book, making it the shrine, the most holy. Where would you start thereafter? Well, the spirit starts with the atoning work of Christ. Because without that, no one's going to get there. He won't have a bride without the atoning work that was accomplished. And so we're going to, we're going to find in our study here uh, this morning on Ehud that that's exactly what we see, the great atoning work of our Lord Jesus Christ. But for the sake of those who might not have been with us last evening, just a couple of introductory comments uh, to bring back some of the key messages of interpreting the book of Judges. And I think it's very important that we stand back and see what the Spirit has done here. Now you'll have in your book, of course, this particular chart which shows the, the Judges of Israel as types. Samson's not there, although he is a type of Christ. But you can see that the area, the coverage from the, the death of Christ through to the end of the millennium uh, that's covered by these judges as types of Christ. And we pointed out the verse that wasn't read this morning was verse 31 of Judges 3. And I think just like to bring your attention back to that verse again. It's about Shamgar, just one verse. And after him, that is after Ehud, was Shamgar, the son of Anath, which slew of the Philistines 600 men with an ox goad, and he also delivered Israel. We made the point last night, as you can see there on the screen behind me, that the, the book of Judges is not just history. It is history, but it's not just history. It's actually prophecy. So the case of Shamgar is a classic demonstration of that fact. Here is a man who, who has Samson-like feats. He kills 600 men with a stick. And yet we've only got the one verse about that man. Why? Well, because he's not a type of Christ. That's why. So when you have a full record of a judge, you will find Christ in that judge. The type will be there. And you'll see it in all its glory once you have the secret to unlock it. Now, you know, it was once said, and I, I often say it myself, that if when you're studying a context, we're not talking about one verse here, we're talking about a context, when you're studying a context anywhere, in the Old Testament, if you haven't found Christ in it, well then you haven't looked hard enough. Because Christ will be there. That's why God wrote the Word. He had Him in mind before the creation, and of course He knew the great need that would exist by His foreknowledge. So He made provision. So when the Word was written through Moses and those who followed Him, Christ is the primary subject of the Bible. So if you haven't found Him, in the book of Judges, or Joshua, or Kings, or Genesis, go looking for him, because you'll find him there if you look hard enough. That's the, the principle you're going to see come out of our studies here on Judges. So there's the rule of thumb. Where there is a substantial record of a judge, they are a type of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we saw Othniel last evening fit that bill. He was a man who was of the tribe of Judah, whose name means the Lion of God. And he conquers, of course, that city, Kirjath-Sepha, the city of the book. He makes it into the shrine or the innermost part of the sanctuary. He made it holy, as our Lord Jesus Christ will. And he took as his prize to display to the world, Aksa, the daughter of Caleb. Clearly a type of the bride of Christ. She had both Jewish and Gentile origins, did that, that woman. And so she represents you and me, brothers and sisters. And here we see the lamb, as it were, upon Mount Zion in the company of his bride when, of course, that mountain is exalted in the events of Armageddon. So it's a wonderful type that is presented. But he becomes Israel's first judge. He judges for 40 years. He gives rest for 40 years. And we saw that his final work was the work of the destruction of the king of Babylon, Babylon the Great, Cushan Rishathaim. So we began last night with that wonderful type that's there in Judges chapter 1. And now we want to move on to the second judge of Israel because we're going to see just how it is that the bride of Christ, this woman Aksar, will end up there with our Lord Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, 
this woman, because of her knowledge that you cannot promote and build a seed without the water of the word is there as a, as a constant exhortation to you and me that if we want to be part of the bride of Christ then like her, we have to secure water for the heritage of Yahweh our God uh, to be built up. Well, let's now come to Ehud. Now, Ehud, of course, uh, had his judgeship in this area here, primarily in the area of Benjamin, because he was of the tribe of Benjamin. And his work is performed in the city of Jericho, as we're going to see uh, in a moment. So here we've got the beginning of a story in Judges chapter 3, as we read from verse 12. And the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of Yahweh, and he strengthened Eglon, the king of Moab, against Israel, because they had done evil in his sight. So here we have Ehud, the saviour of Israel, raised up to save them from the fat man of Moab, as we're going to see in a moment. So Eglon gathers his confederates. We read of that in verse 13. And he gathered unto him the children of Ammon, and Amalek, and went and smote Israel, and possessed the city of palm trees. Now, palm tree. Well, we're going to talk about a palm tree a little later on in our studies on Deborah. But here we have the city of palm trees. And we know that this is the city of Jericho. Deuteronomy chapter 34 and verse 3 will tell us that, amongst other passages that tell you that Jericho was known otherwise as the city of of palm trees. Now why is Jericho so important in this story? Well it's absolutely critical because you see Jericho represented Israel's capture of the land and victory over all their enemies. Now this is demonstrated not only in the, in the story of Joshua but in one particular passage when Joshua comes to summarise before Israel what had happened when they took the land in Joshua chapter 24 and verse 11, we have a key verse. I want you to have a look at it with me. Joshua chapter 24 and verse 11. So here as Joshua recounts, as Israel came into the land, he says this in verse 11, in his final address to the nation. And ye went over Jordan and came unto Jericho, and the men of Jericho fought against you. Now, think about that, brothers and sisters. Did the men of Jericho fight against Israel? Well, the answer to that is no. Israel marched around the city for seven days. On the seventh day, they went around seven times. The walls collapsed. Most people were killed. They went in and chopped up a few people. The men of Jericho didn't fight against Israel. Read on in verse 11. It says, the men of Jericho fought against you, the Amorites, and the Perizzites, and the Canaanites, and the Hittites, and the Girgashites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, and I delivered them into your hand. Well, very few of those were in Jericho, weren't they? Jebusites were in Jebus. The Hivites were in the middle of the land. They weren't in Jericho. Do you see what's being said here? Jericho was representative of the whole land. And the people in it who were devoted to destruction were typical of what should have happened to all the Canaanites in the land. The seven tribes that were there in that land. They were scattered all over the land. They weren't at Jericho, but Jericho represented them. So when Israel took Jericho, it was like God saying, that's the guarantee. You've taken the whole land. So that's the principle that comes out of Joshua chapter 24 and verse 11. So what do you think would happen if you lose Jericho? Well, for a start, it shouldn't have been there. It should never have been uh, there because it was destroyed. But it had been rebuilt, at least in part. It shouldn't have been there. But it was there. But when it's taken from Israel, what do you reckon that represents? Well, it's the same thing, isn't it? It means that they've lost the whole land. You've lost your inheritance. It's gone. So here we have the principle. We, we meet in Judges chapter 3. That when this fat man of Moab 
come and secures, comes and secures control of the city of Jericho, it is as though Israel has lost its inheritance in the land. They are in desperate straits. And of course, God's answer to that is Ehud. And can I make the point that you and I, because of the sin of Adam, lost an inheritance, didn't we? There was a fall. And he passed his nature on to us. And we would have absolutely no hope if God had not provided his salvation. And we're going to see just how effective Ehud is as a type of Christ. So he comes from Benjamin, this man. And he has to deal with this man, Eglon, king of Moab. Now Eglon's name means like a calf. It comes from the root meaning to be round or circular. And of course he was very round. And he was very circular. He was a massive man, as we're going to see in a moment in verse 17. But interestingly enough, when the high priest of Israel was to make an offering for himself on the Day of Atonement, in Leviticus chapter 16 and verse 11, he took a bullock for the sin offering of the priest, the high priest, for that day. So the high priest of Israel was represented in sacrifice by a bullock. Now, I want you to just make that little connection because I'm going to try and demonstrate to you in a moment that what we have here in Eglon is a type of king's sin. And we're going to see that when Ehud comes in to destroy him, he identifies himself with Eglon. There are two men in one room who effectively become one. And one of them doesn't leave the room. He's dead. We're going to see in that a type of the sacrificial work of Christ. Now in Judges 3.17, we have the emphasis of how fat this man was. It says in the AV, And he brought the present unto Eglon, king of Moab. And Eglon was a very fat man. Rotherham translates it, he was an exceedingly fat man. So you get a bit of a picture in your mind. Now we all know about Goliath. He was nine foot six tall or whatever it was. He was huge vertically. Well, Eglon was huge horizontally. He was, you know, he was just constantly eating this man. You could never satisfy his appetite. He kept on putting his hand to his mouth and so he grew and he grew and he grew. He becomes a symbol for King Sin. And of course we know about human nature, don't we? If it's let loose, it has an insatiable appetite. And I'll tell you something. If you've ever tried to appease the desires of human nature, then you'll give up trying, won't you, eventually, because you can never appease it. It's like the Apostle Paul says that evil men shall wax worse and worse. They go from one evil to another evil. When they've done that evil, they're not satisfied with it. So they go to another evil. And then they go to another evil. That's why the world is like it is today. You can never appease human nature. You can only do one thing with it effectively. You've got to crucify it with its affections and lusts. So there we've got the principle seen in this man, Eglon. He just kept on growing because he could never be appeased with whatever they brought him. And Israel were foolish enough to try and appease him, as we're going to see in a moment. So here we have a very fitting symbol for King Sin. Now he has confederates. Ammon and Amalek were among Israel's first and most implacable enemies. I hardly need to remind you what God says about Amalek in Deuteronomy chapter 25 verses 17 and 18. He says, remember what Amalek did unto you when you were in the way how he cut off the weak and the feeble amongst you who fell behind the main bunch of Israel. Remember that? And God goes on to say you've got to utterly exterminate the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. You know what he then says? Don't forget it. That's the last words. Don't forget it. Because we are apt to forget that we're dealing with Amalek. And there are many, sadly, many of our Christadelphians, especially some of our young people, who have been captured by Amalek. They've fallen behind the main bunch. They stop coming to the meetings. You don't see them at camps. And 
then you find out that they've left the truth because they're out there with Amalek and Amalek cuts people's throats. That's what he does. He cuts people's throats and takes what he can from them. It's happening all over our brotherhood. So let's learn the lesson of that. So here's Israel. They're under great duress. They've got this fat man of Moab bearing down upon them. They've got Ammon and Amalek supporting him in that oppression. It's hideous what's happening to this people. So we read in verse 14. So the children of Israel served Eglon, the king of Moab, 18 years. Now 18, of course, is twice nine. Nine is the biblical number for finality and judgment. Double it, you have the principle, of course, that is spelled out in Isaiah chapter 40, where God says, I will make Israel pay. They will pay double for their sins. And so that's the situation we find the nation in here under Ehud. Now we come to verse 15. Now I'm going to spend quite a bit of time on verse 15 because every single phrase in this verse is important in the type. Now, some of this, most of this is going to be in your notes. And by the way, for those of you who are interested, pages 6 and 7, the, the first uh, 13 or so pages are not numbered, but if you number them from page 1 of the summary of the book of Judges, 1 to 13, you'll find that pages 6 and 7 deal with Ehud, and in the next section of the booklet you, that you've been given, the, the typology section, you'll find that Ehud is dealt with on pages 2 and 3. So you might want to check out that I'm actually telling you what I should be telling you. So here we've got a very important verse. And we read this in verse 15. But when the children of Israel cried, and the word means to shriek, so they were in anguish, anguish they sh they were crying out to their God, shrieking to him. When they cried unto Yahweh, he raised them up, a deliverer. Now here's the word that we met back in verse 9 of chapter 3. Yasha. You know, it's part of the name Joshua. It's part of the name Jesus, the Greekized form of Joshua. So he's, he's Yahweh's salvation. He's set forth as a type of Yahshua, Jesus. <coughs> Yahweh's salvation to Israel. I don't think there's any doubt that that's what's being set forth here in Ehud. Now his name means united from the root to unify. So the work of this man is to unify a disparate, scattered, oppressed people. That's his work. So he's Yahweh's salvation sent to unify. He happens to be the son of Jira. Now son here, of course, as you'll be aware, is Ben. And Ben means a family builder. So he's the family builder of Jira. Jira means one grain, one single seed. Do I need to remind you of Galatians 3 verse 16 when God made promise to Abraham? Paul explains he didn't speak to seeds as to many. He spoke of one seed and to thy seed which is Christ. And we become part of Christ by baptism into him and therefore become Abraham's seed in Christ. So here is a man who has a name. He is Yahweh's salvation. He's going to unify God's people. He's going to build the family into one seed. Got a, got a feel where that's heading? It's quite plainly a type of our Lord Jesus Christ. But it gets better because it then says this. It says he was a Benjamite. Now you know what the name Benjamin means. It means the son of the right hand. And we're reminded of Passages like Psalm 80 and verse 17. Let thy hand be upon the man of thy right hand, even the son of man, whom thou made strong for thyself. You're going to see that in Judges chapter 3. A type of the work of our Lord Jesus Christ as the son of the right hand. But he had a problem. He had a problem. He was left-handed. Any left-handers in here? Yeah, as if come, I'm not saying anything nasty about you. So, <laughs> what I'm saying here, and I'm gonna, I'll show you why I can't say anything nasty about you, because you know what this word means when it says a man left-handed? In the, in the Hebrew, it is itter um, yad. 
Ita yad. It actually means shut up in the right hand. So he's described as a man. And the word in the Hebrew here, and there are a number of words for men in the Old Testament, is ish. Often, very often, means a mighty man. So he's a mighty man, but he has a problem. He's left-handed. Now, most Benjamites, of course, were left-handed. What that meant was that they were simply not practised with the right hand. They, they hadn't been taught to use the right hand. Now, when I was a, a young child, I apparently used to pick up things like a knife or whatever with my left hand, and my parents didn't want me to be left-handed. So they would put the knife into my right hand and train me to be right-handed. So guess what? I'm ambidextrous. <laughs> so there you go, see? So if you're not practised in your right hand, well, then you may use your left. But that's interesting because, you see, the right hand in the Bible is the symbol for power and authority. There you are, right-handers. Okay? Power and authority. And the left hand, sorry, the left hand is a symbol for human weakness. That's what it's a symbol for, human weakness. Do you want proof of this? I can give you tons of proof. Let me just give you one. You take Genesis 48. When Joseph brought his 21 and 20 year old boys to be blessed by his father Jacob in what Paul describes as Jacob's greatest act of faith, he carefully choreographed it so that he brought Manasseh, the oldest boy, to Jacob's right hand. So Manasseh's on Joseph's left. He's going to come up against Jacob's right hand. And so the younger boy, Ephraim, was on Joseph's right, so he would come up against Jacob's left hand. And when Jacob went and put his right hand on Manasseh's head, Joseph was very upset. He was extremely upset. He said, not so, my father, not so. Why is it so important? What does it matter? Well, it mattered a lot. The blessing with the right hand was absolutely crucial for the firstborn. Yeah. Got a picture? Yeah. I'll give you many, many cases like that where the left hand is clearly representative of human mortal weakness. So why is that important? Well, it's very important in the type, isn't it? Because what we have here is a man who's set forth as a type of Christ. He's the son of the right hand, made strong for Yahweh to overcome the problem of the oppression of sin. But he doesn't have any confidence in his own strength. He's a left-handed man. Absolutely no trust in his own strength. That's the message that comes through that. So here we go on in verse 15. We're not quite done yet. Go on to read this. So he's a Benjamite, a great man, shut up in his right hand, therefore left-handed. And it says, by him, the children of Israel sent a present unto Eglon, the king of Moab. Yes, they had a policy. They were going to send an acknowledgement by him. That is, he was Israel's chosen representative to take their gift. You know why they chose him? They chose him because he was dispensable. They knew the quality of this man, and he was dispensable. So they thought, well, if Eglon gets angry and he kills Ehud, well, that will get that problem off our hands. That's what they thought. So he was sent. He had different ideas, of course, but they sent with him what's called a present. The Hebrew word is minkar. It means a gift or a present. But it was always an acknowledgement offering, the minkar. When you made a minkar, you were acknowledging something. So here was Israel acknowledging the supremacy of King Sin. The whole world does that. Don't they? They acknowledge the supremacy of King Sin. But Ehud's got different ideas. Now I want to show you a passage that actually deals with this matter. I want you to come to John chapter 11. Verses 49 to 53. John 11. And here we have what happened to our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's just pick the record up from verse 47 of John 11. Where we read, Then gathered the 
the chief priests and the Pharisees a council and said, What do we? For this man, Jesus, doeth many miracles. If we let him thus alone, all men will believe on him, and the Romans shall come and take away both our place and our nation. You can't have that. You can't take away the biggest business in the world in that era. No, I can't have that. So what was going to be the policy? Verse 49. And one of them, named Caiaphas, being the high priest that same year, said unto them, you're all ignorant. Listen to me. Nor consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people, and that the whole nation perish not. Now, then we get the divine commentary in verse 51. It says this. And this spake he not of himself, of course not, he wouldn't give himself up, would he? But he's going to give up Jesus Christ to the Romans. He was dispensable. Yeah, let's make him an offering to the Romans so that we can appease the Romans. All right? See what he's doing here? We'll appease the Romans, just like Israel was doing in Judges 3. They chose a man who was dispensable and they sent him with a gift to appease the Romans. But I want you to read on in John 11. This is what it says. Verse 51. This he spake not of himself, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus should die for that nation. And not for that nation only, but that also he should gather together in one the children of God that were scattered abroad. Got it? Ehud means unify. And that verse tells us the work of our Lord Jesus Christ was to gather together into one, one seed. Ehud, the unifier, the family builder of the one seed, the son of the right hand. Could it be more pristine than that? Do you think? No. You know you're dealing with the spirit mind, brothers and sisters, when you have scripture interpreting scripture. You know it. And there it is. It's a classic example of the Bible interpreting itself. And then we've got thousands of years, thousands of years between these two scriptures, and yet there it is. So let's come back to Judges chapter 3 and have a look at what Ehud's policy was. We know what Israel's policy was. It was the same as the scribes and the Pharisees of the Lord's day. What was Ehud's policy? Well, it was the forerunner of our Lord Jesus Christ. He had a very different policy. So we come to Judges 3, and we read there in verse 16 these words. But Ehud made him a dagger, which had two edges of a cubit length, and he did gird it under his raiment, upon his right thigh. Another verse that's absolutely replete with information. So this dagger was homemade. He didn't go down the street and buy a dagger. He didn't go to his next door neighbour and say, here, lend me a sword. He was a Christadelphian who knew you had to do your own Bible study. No point in getting someone else to do it for you. You've got to apply your mind to the Word of God yourself. He made for himself a dagger. Are we doing that? We making for ourselves a two-edged sword? We got one in front of us, but it's no good for you unless it gets into your brain. And it's sharp in there, I can tell you. So we've got to make, we've got to take the lesson out of this. He made for himself a dagger, and this was no toothpick that we're dealing with here, because it was 18 inches long. And the word in the Hebrew is kereg, it means a knife or a sword. And the very first occurrence of that Hebrew word is in Genesis 3.24, when man, having sinned, having been provided with the Redeemer, the promise of a Redeemer, and the skin of a lamb, is brought to the place where the cherubim keep the way to the tree of life. There is a way of return. And guess what's there? A two-edged sword. A flaming sword, same Hebrew word that you find here rendered dagger in the AV of Judges 3 and verse 16. So there's no question as to where that's coming from. Now it's, we're told it's got two edges. Did you want to know that? Yeah. 
We do want to know that because we know that the two-edged sword is a symbol for the Word of God. And in Hebrews 4 verse 12, Paul, of course, talks about the Word of God in that language. He says it is quick and it's powerful and it's sharper than any two-edged sword. It divides between that which is soulish or fleshly and that which is spiritual. It carves consciences. It creates consciences and carves away carnality. That's what it does. Very sharp. So you've got to make one for yourself. So what does he do with this two-edged sword that's 18 inches long? Which Paul in Ephesians 6 verse 17 says, this is the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. What did he do with it? Well, it says that he girded it under his right thigh, on his right thigh, under his raiment. Now, under the law of Moses, the right shoulder or the right thigh was the strongest and most important part of any offering made, which is why it fell to the presiding priest. The priest who was Yahweh's representative always got the right shoulder or the right thigh. Why? Well, because it represented the very best of that offering, the strongest part of the offering. So what's the strongest part of your body? Uncle Stan thinks it's his femur, all right? His thigh. He's quite right. They tell you if you want to lift weights, don't lift it with your back, don't lean over. Use your thighs. It's the strongest part of your body. So that's talking physically. What's the strongest part of your body talking spiritually? Well, your mind. And that's why the Apostle Peter, in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13, says, Gird up the loins of your mind. There's loincloth there. Gird up the loins of your mind. So here is a man who puts this symbol of the Word of God in the strongest part of his body. Got a picture? Pretty simple, isn't it? But it's a classic example of what our Lord Jesus Christ did because he was the Word made flesh. By the way, the Roman Machaira that Paul talks about in Ephesians 6 was 18 inches long. The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. So we come down and have a look at what happens. We read verse 17 about this fat man of Moab. Verse 18. And when he had made an end to offer the present, he sent away the people that bear the present. He wanted nothing to do with their compromise with King Sin. He's going to finish off this man. That's his policy, quite different to those that came with him. But verse 19 says, but he, he, he himself turned again from the quarries. Now this word quarries in the Hebrew has the idea of a place of idols. You know, he used to chisel out idols here. So when he got as far as the place where they made their I idols and therefore promoted their idolatry, he'd had enough. He turned around and went back to complete the mission. And so he comes back and in verse 19 we read this. But he himself turned again from the quarries that were by Gilgal, and of course Gilgal has to do with the cutting off of the flesh. Gilgal means rolling away, rolling away the reproach of Egypt. That's where Israel was circumcised for the second time. This is about cutting off the flesh. He was by Gilgal, he said, I have a secret errand unto thee, O king. Now this word errand is the Hebrew word deba. It means the word. Rotherham translates it a secret word. Yeah, it was a secret word. It was a two-edged sword bound to his right thigh. It was in the strongest part of his body. And he's going to use it to destroy King Sin. Secret word. Here we've got a marvellous type developing. Goes on to say in verse 19, the king says, keep silence. In other words, everybody get out. Which means that he's left in that room alone with Eglon. All that stood by him went out from him, we're told at the end of verse 19. And then we read this in verse 20. And Ehud came unto him. Yes, he's going to identify himself with this man. He's going to get as close as he can without being defiled by him. 
We're going to see that again in our studies in Judges chapter 4 in the case of Jael. Our Lord Jesus Christ came as close as he could to King sin, without being defiled by him. He came bearing our nature and dealt with it every single day of his life. That's as close as he could get. You and I get a bit closer because we submit to him. Don't we? Sometimes we bow down to King Sin and we let him do his business in our life. Our Lord Jesus Christ got close but never bowed down to him. Ehud comes close, but he doesn't bow down to this man. He's about to use his left hand to use the sharp two-edged sword on this man's belly. That's what he's going to do. So we've got a classic representation of the sacrificial work of Christ. But you see there in verse 20 it says, He came unto him, was sitting in his summer parlour, which he had for himself alone. Notice the emphasis, for himself alone. This work's going to be done, as it were, in one man. And he had said, I have a message from God. And this word message is also the Hebrew word debar. I have got a word from God unto thee, O king. Now this raises the hackles of Eglon, the fat man of Moab. Because we then read that he arose out of his seat. And that was some effort for this man. He was a giant. I mean, he was massive. You get a picture of this man... He arose out of his seat, this man of blubber, and he's standing there. Got a picture? (laughs) Good representation of King Sin, isn't it? Yeah. What do serpents do when you approach them? Chap across the road from where we live heard some noise from his chicken coop. He went down to investigate. He went around the corner, and there was an eight-foot King Brown, one of the most deadliest snakes in the world, who was trying to get eggs or whatever it was out of the chicken coop. He came around the corner and this snake went. <laughs> now your snakes do that, don't they? Alright? Like, you don't move, they don't think you're there. So he went away. But that's what snakes do. And you know what happens when you present the word of God to your nature? Hands up the brother in this room who when he decides he's gonna, he has to do some Bible study finds it easy to get to the desk. Anyone? You'll find every excuse that you can make. Oh, I need a cup of coffee. I'll go and make a cup of coffee and then you can chat to the wife and turn the radio on or whatever it might be. Dilly dally. Because you see, <laughs> the fact is, brothers and sisters and young people, if you're anything like me, It's hard to sit down and focus your mind on the Word of God. You know why? Because it cuts up the flesh into pieces. That's not comfortable. You say, it's simply not comfortable. It's much easier to watch television, isn't it? That's comfortable. But the Bible is sharp. It hurts. It tells you that you're messing up. You better get your act together. Right? You don't want to hear that. The flesh doesn't want to hear that. And that's what happens. So when you've got this man coming to the fat man of Moab who represents King Sin, he says, I've got a, I've got a word from God. You've got what? <laughs> <laughs> got a picture? Maybe slightly dramatic, but anyway, you've got a picture. You, know, you understand the lesson, don't you? You can see it. It's a classic lesson. Wonderful lesson that's there in this record. And so we have verse 21. Here's the situation, brothers and sisters and young people. Ehud and Eglon are alone behind locked doors. It's typical of the putting to death of King Sin by the power of the word of God girded in the mind of the unifier of Israel, the son of the right hand who put no trust in the arm of flesh. So which hand does he use? The left hand. He uses his left hand. Look at it. Verse 21. And he had put forth his left hand. Christ had to die on the cross in mortal weakness in order to put to death King Sin himself. That is perfectly accurate, isn't it? 
It was by weakness, human weakness, that he defeated. By death, says Paul, Hebrews 2.14, that he put to death the diabolos within. That's what you'd expect. See, he had put forth his left hand and he took the dagger from his right thigh, the strongest part of his body, and thrust it into his belly. You know what Paul says in Philippians 3 about people who serve King Sin? He says, their God is their belly. That's what he was doing. His God was his belly. And that's where the two-edged sword goes in. And it goes in so deep that it disappears out of sight. You know, if I was really going to be, you know, sort of on the pushing the envelope a bit here, I would say it was as though the word was made flesh. Okay? The sword disappears inside the body of this man. Accurate, isn't it? Very accurate. What we see here. The wonderful message. He had set forth the work of Yahweh's Saviour. So where does this all lead? Well, it leads to victory over the tomb. If we look with me, what we read in verse 23. That he had went forth through the porch and he shut the doors of the parlour upon him and locked them. Yeah. They rolled a stone in front of the tomb. The doors were locked when they killed him. But then an angel comes and rolls it away. And the Lord is raised. And he escapes on the third day. That's what happens here. Look at verse 24. And when he was gone out, his servants came. So what did Christ leave behind as it were in the tomb? He left behind mortality. That's what he left behind. And so when Ehab comes out of this locked parlour, he leaves behind dead King Sin, as far as he himself was concerned. And so we've got the record going on to say that his servants, as they stood outside the door, wondered how long he was going to be in the washroom, as they say in this country. They thought he was in the washroom. See there? Surely he covereth his feet in the summer chamber. No, he wasn't in the washroom. He was lying dead on the floor of what effectively is a tomb just like the tomb of our Lord Jesus Christ and verse 25 tells us and they tarried till they were ashamed and behold he opened not the doors of the parlour therefore they took a key and they opened them and behold their Lord yes brothers and sisters and young people it's their Lord not our Lord our Lord escaped from the tomb We've got to make some choices in life. The world out there is serving their Lord. We serve another one. One who sits at the right hand of God who escaped from that tomb. Their Lord lay dead on the earth. And we read in verse 26, And he had escaped while they tarried and passed beyond the quarries. Yes, that's the place of idolatry. He goes way beyond that. And he comes to a place called Sirath. So here he is, escapes alive, beyond the idols of carnality, to Sirach. It means, in the Hebrew, the she-goat or the kid. And of course, the she-goat or kid was used under the law of Moses in Leviticus 4, verse 28 and 5, verse 6, for the sin offering. So he comes to the place of the sin offering, where that sin offering would be memorialized. So what does he do here? Well, he blows a trumpet. Look what it says in verse 27. And it came to pass when he was come that he blew a shofar in the mountain of Ephraim. Oh, look, it's unbelievable. Blew a trumpet? Yeah, resurrection. In Mount Ephraim? Yeah, double fruit from Jew and Gentile. So we've got the work of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then it says that he went before his people. See at the end of verse 27? And he before them. And what does he say to them in verse 28? Follow after me. If any man will follow after me, let him take up his cross daily and follow after me. You know those words. There it is. That's done in the place of the sin offering. Here we've got a wonderful type of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then what does he do? 
Well, he eliminates all carnal flesh. You have a look at it. Verse, the end of verse 28 says, And they went down after him and took the fords of Jordan. So what happened at the fords of Jordan? Well, Israel was baptised there, weren't they? When they crossed the Jordan, so to speak, baptism of the Spirit. They were baptised in the Red Sea, that's a baptism of water. They were covered by water, says Paul in 1 Corinthians 10. We go through that process, we're baptised by water. But we're about to be baptised by the Spirit, by a change of nature. So they took the fords of Jordan, where John baptised our Lord Jesus Christ. So there's no question what that represents. Here we've got, brothers and sisters and young people, the end of the work of Christ being portrayed. And it says at the end of verse 28, and they suffered not a man to pass over. They put to death all carnal flesh. And they slew of Moab at that time about 10,000 men. And 10,000 in the word of God represents all. And all men, it says, who are lusty. Now that word lusty actually in the Hebrew means greasy. Yeah, like their master. You know, he was greasy. You see these people? They keep on consuming food, McDonald's, whatever it might be, and it comes out of their skin. They're greasy. Well, they're all like their master. Yeah, that's exactly the way it is, isn't it? They're all like their master. The servants of King Sin. And what are you going to do with them? Put to death the flesh in the waters of baptism. That's what you do with them. And the kingdom age, they'll all go through those waters of baptism. And that's where the work of Christ will culminate with the eradication of sin and death at the end of the thousand years. Do you think it culminates there? I want to show you it does. I want you to have a look at verse 30. So Moab was subdued. You know what that word subdued is? Kana, the root of Canaan. Moab was subdued that day under the hand of Israel and the land had rest four score years. And we made the point that in verse 11 of this same chapter, Othniel gave to Israel 40 years rest. And we made the point that, that represents in the type the millennial period, a period of probation for the world that will lead ultimately to the destruction of the last enemy. And that's what Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 24 to 28, which you can see on the screen behind me. I want to show you something about that passage that clearly relates back here to Judges 3. And we know it pretty well. Then cometh the end, when he shall deliver up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall put down all rule and all authority and power. Now, as some ingenious young person counted up the yellow balls there, and you could have been counting up there to see what, how many there are. Ten. ten. Yeah, there are ten. And the translators have been perfectly consistent. It's the Greek word pas. This word you can see down here, pas. It occurs ten times in this passage, which is a bracket of verses, a context in its own right. All right? It's all about the time of the end of the millennium and what happens beyond, when God is all and in all. But there's another word there. See the one in green? Now, you won't pick this up from the from the King James Version and maybe not from most translations. You actually have to go to the Greek text to find this out. But the other dominant word here is the word hupo. It occurs by itself and it also occurs as part of another word, hupo tasso. I'll give you the details of that in a moment. So we have ten alls and eight occurrences of the word hupo. So what does that mean, do you think? Why in that context do you have these two dominant words? Why? Ask yourself that question. Well, because you see, 10 times 8 is 80. And 8 is a very important number in the Bible, as is the number 10. So the rest before score years, pass 10 times, hupo, 8 times in the Greek text, twice by itself and 6 times as part of the word hupotassa. Eight is the number of a new beginning and immortality. And I can give you a plethora of examples from the Bible 
that eight is the number of immortality. No question about it. And ten is the number for all. In other words, 1 Corinthians 15, verses 24 to 28, is pointing to the time when God will be all and in all. They're all going to be immortal. All of them. At the end of the thousand years, when sin and death have been removed. And 80 is the number that represents that. And so Eha, who is a wonderful type of the atoning work of our Lord Jesus Christ, his story ends where Christ's story is going to end. When he gives the kingdom back to God because sin and death will have been eradicated, his atoning work will be complete. Got it? What a wonderful representation we see in Ehud, the unifier of the family of the one seed, the son of the right hand, who put absolutely no confidence in the flesh, but did as we must try and do, brothers and sisters and young people, made a two-edged sword for himself. Next study, God willing, we'll have a look at Genesis 3.15 in the story of Deborah and Barak.